Welcome everyone. My name is Colin Hahn. I'm the learning and organizational development leader at Douglas Dynamics. And today I'm thrilled to be here with Guy Wallace to talk about performance-focused learning and development and how we can address the critical business issues that our organizations are facing. Guy has been working in performance-focused learning and development for four decades now. He has a ton of experience that he brings to the table and I'm really excited to be having this conversation. So Guy, thanks so much for making the time today. Well, thank you for having me. So to kick things off, there's a lot of talk in learning and development about different goals that we have. There's a lot of discussion about how we generate ROI, how we move from just training to now having an impact and um, being able to do application, all of those sorts of things. Obviously, that's slightly connected to performance-focused L&D, but that's when we talk about performance-focused L&D, it really is a more specific thing. There's a, a real strong um, just background that comes along with that. And so can you tell a little bit about what your background has been in in this area of the field and just help people understand what is and maybe what is not performance focused learning and development. Yes, well, uh, so this is something that I began to learn my very first day out of college in my first job in a training organization for Wix Lumber up in Saginaw, Michigan. And, and I was given several things. One of them was a newsletter from 1970 from the Praxis organization, which was the consulting firm of the late Gary Rumler and the late Tom Gilbert, two big gurus in this whole field of what I generally call performance-based instruction, uh, because instruction includes both performance guides or job aids and training or learning experiences. You know, there's old language and new language and all of that. I was also given a book by Bob Mager and Peter Pipe, on analyzing performance problems, or you really they really ought to want to perform. And I was also given Tom Gilbert's book from the year earlier, 1978, on human competence. And that began my orientation and development in a performance orientation to instruction or training or learning. And there's a lot of different models. There's a lot of different people, contemporaries of mine, uh, who are still active, who are promoting this kind of approach. Now, we use slightly different language and we have slightly different imagery for as we portray, you know, what we're talking about. But so there's more than one way to look at this and talk about it. But for me, there's a lot of talk about outcomes. And I was always focused on outputs first and the measures for them. And the measures come from the various stakeholders, regulators, customers downstream, uh, fellow employees, um, management, shareholders, there's a lot of various stakeholders in a performance context that have that care about either the output that's produced or they care about the tasks or they care about both. Um, but for me, outcomes are when the outputs that are produced by task performance or the overall process, when those outputs meet the stakeholder requirements, you get a positive income. When they don't meet the stakeholders' requirements, you get a negative outcome. So outcomes are attached to outputs, but it has to do with the output and its measures and whether those measures and standards are being met. For example, if your output, your product produced doesn't meet regulatory requirements, well, that's a bad outcome. If it does, that's a good outcome. Um, if you're doing things profitably, well, that's good for management and the shareholders. And if you're not, that's a bad outcome. So my focus is generally on outputs. That's the center of everything. Once I know what the outputs produced by performers performing, then I can ask the question about, well, who are the stakeholders and how do they measure this? And when I'm dealing with master performers, they know what the formal and informal measures are. There may be formal measures that are stated. And sometimes I've been told by master performers, ah, they don't mean a thing. We don't pay any attention to that stuff, guy. We're focused on this and this and this because that's how the real world measures things. Our management may be measuring these things as well, but you know they're not going to mess with us because we're successful. So that's a bit tricky to pin down the output. And then you can go, well, how is this measured? Um, what are those measures? You know, better, faster, cheaper, timeliness, all sorts of different standard kinds of metrics that are, are typically used in an enterprise. And you need to use those to start with to figure out how is this measured and who is measuring these things. Then you would know 
how to achieve positive outcomes and avoid negative outcomes. So to start with the output, then you begin to look at, well, what are the tasks performed? Now, sometimes machines perform tasks, sometimes humans perform tasks, sometimes in combination. But there's a series of tasks that are performed in a process to produce the output. And so we can begin to understand that. Now, there's two types of tasks. There's behavioral tasks that we can see, we can count them, we can measure them. And then there's the cognitive tasks, the thinking tasks. Therein lies the trickiness of analysis in trying to create content because you got to teach, people have to learn how to think about what they're doing. So the things that are overt that we can see, that's one thing. The things that are covert, cognitive tasks, the thinking tasks, we cannot. And people will tell you what they're thinking, but they're often wrong. And their egos demand that they share with you, you know, this is what I'm thinking when I'm doing this, no kidding. But so we need to appreciate the fact that before, during, and after behavioral tasks, there's cognitive tasks. I mean, look at the situation, decide, do I do the standard rote? performance here? Do I vary it somehow? While I'm doing it, I've got to be thinking about, am I doing this correctly or not? Or is there anything new information that's come my way that I need to change for some reason? When I'm done, did I do this successfully? Am I ready to go on to my next step, et cetera? So this is the tricky part. And what the research shows us about uh, cognitive tasks is that experts can tell you about 30% of what they think about how they make decisions in the workflow, in the work processes, in the work streams. So they're gonna be missing 70%. When we single source our expertise to build instructional content, we have to be aware that we could be accurate, we could be appropriate with our content, but our content is likely incomplete because of the experts have automated that knowledge. It's unconscious or non-conscious. And so when we're working with groups, it's better to work with groups because they can feed off of each other. I've had groups tell me, okay, there are seven tasks here. Here they are. And somebody else in the room will be looking back and they'll go, you know, between tasks two and three, there's actually two more tasks in between those. So a long time ago, I learned not to ever number my tasks on a flip chart easel but to bullet them because otherwise I'm changing the numbers all the time. But uh, so I use a group process when I'm doing analysis, that's my preference. I don't always get to do that. Um, but I am leveraging the, the collective expertise and understanding of the group to try to build my content more and more complete. And I'll know that it'll never be fully complete. Now, what Richard E. Clark, uh, Professor, Emeritus from the University of Southern California, who's done a lot of research on this. He has a methodology called cognitive task analysis. And there are many different versions of this, over a hundred versions of it. He and his colleagues have studied in the past. Most of them don't do what they purport to do. So you have to be careful about embracing one. But the whole goal is to figure out well, what is the thinking behind the doing and how do we get that more and more complete? Because you could hold a gun to somebody's head and they can't tell you because they've automated it. It's not accessible to them. It's not that they don't want to, they could want to, but they can't. So the good news in all of this is that every expert or any of us actually, whether we're experts or not, uh, have automated a different 30 or have uh, automated a different 70%. And so when you talk to a number of people, they can add uh, and uh, amend what others have told you. And so what he said is that after about five interviews with people, he prefers doing individual interviews, uh, you've kind of gotten as much as you're going to get out of them. And that may be around 85% of being complete. But so if, since we're dealing with people who don't know how to do something and we're trying to teach them how to do something, we can give them the behavioral tasks. And if you relied on an expert to tell you what the behavioral tasks that you could see and observe and count they're going to give you about 50% of that because they've automated that as well. So, but we can go and watch them perform and see what they might have missed in telling us what their various steps are. The cognitive things are thinking, we can't observe that. So this is what's most difficult about it. And when we create instructional content based on the, the information that we're given by 
experts and subject matter experts and master performers, we have to do a number of tests to see, to bring more people in, engage more people in the development process and the developmental testing to see what's missing. And we always need to be aware, in my view, that th something is probably missing. What is it? Can I find it? How can I find it and uncover what those gaps are in my own content before I make it available to everybody? So this is where in the development process, I do alpha testing and beta testing, getting ready for a pilot test. I've extracted pilot testing out of the development process, if you will, to make a bigger deal about it with my clients, to talk about, you know, I really need to do a, a full destructive test. I need to find what's missing or broken in my instructional content. And to do that, I ask for target audience members so I can see, measure their pre and post learning. And I bring in experts who theoretically aren't going to learn anything because theoretically they know it all. That's not always true. But they can tell me whether my content was accurate, complete, and appropriate. The learners, the target audience, can't tell me because they don't know this. So I need two groups of people to test my content out. And, and this is where analysis, when we're doing analysis, we do analysis perhaps in an analysis phase. When we get into a design phase, we're also doing analysis. When we get into development, we're doing analysis. And when we get into pilot testing, we're continuing to do analysis, looking for what are the tasks that are necessary to for performance to produce the outputs, and what are the knowledge and skills that are required. And so we're always should be conscious of the fact that we're likely to be incomplete. So where the heck is that? How do I recover and uncover what's missing and plug it into place? Yeah. So as you're describing that, yeah, the idea of output seems to be really central to the way that you're thinking about this. And I'm, I'm trying to make a contrast with maybe the way that a lot of us have been trained to think about instructional design, which is that you know you come up with your list of learning objectives. There's certainly a needs analysis process that goes into it, but you figure out, you know, what are the knowledge and skills, what are the behaviors and so on. And it sounds like what your process is doing is really focusing on as a starting point, what are the outputs that need to be produced? And so the question is less about, um, you know, has someone effectively transferred what they've learned to the workplace? And now is a much more tangible, well, are they producing the right outputs as a result of what they have done? Does that sound roughly correct? Yes. And I, but I, and so there's a couple of contexts for people who learn instructional design or now learning experience design. And that's an enterprise learning context and an educational learning context. In an educational learning context, we generally uh, define our learning objectives. You know, do we need to know that Christopher Columbus stumbled across America in 1492? You know, that's kind of arbitrary, you know, but the history professor gets to decide that's going to be on the test or not. And so, uh, so there's things in an educational world uh, that are sometimes arbitrary, sometimes not. Um, you need to know how to add and subtract and to do other advanced calculations. But but so there are things in learning that they don't know what you're going to be doing with this in the job. You're in school, you're learning things, but the professors, they kind of think you need to know about spreadsheets and how to set one up, et cetera, but they don't know what you're going to do with it exactly because you could be doing hundreds, if not thousands of different things, you know, applications and spreadsheets. And so they can't go that last mile that we can in enterprise learning, where we can define, if we take the time and effort to define exactly what is guys supposed to do with spreadsheets or active listening or whatever. Um, and so we can define that output and see that, that in the task performance for that output, he's going to be creating a spreadsheet here and a spreadsheet there. And so this is the specifics now. We can get down to brass tacks and create performance objectives that we can then derive learning objectives. Because if we say he's got to do a spreadsheet to produce a cash flow analysis, well, now we can describe the learning objectives that will support that performance objectives. And so the, the, the language in our field is messy because we have these two major camps where there are huge differences in how specific we can be. And in an enterprise learning context, we could, if we 
chose to, if our uh, leaders let us, if our clients let us, we could look at the specifics of our performance workflow, work processes, work streams, and define the outputs and the specific tasks, and then systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. It's not sitting around brainstorming about what do they got to know. We can look at the task performance, say, what do you got to know in order to be able to do tasks one, two, three, four, et cetera. And then we can construct uh, our learning uh, flow and, and configuration when we get into design. But our analysis is, is different in those two uh, situations. And when we, wherever we in analysis or design, because people do them differently, define the objectives in enterprise learning, we should start with, here's the performance objectives, no kidding. And then, so here's what you got to know to be able to do. And that's a different world than uh, instructional designers, learning experience designers who are supporting educational institutions because they can't go that last mile to what are people really going to do for this and how can we measure that? In an enterprise, we can go to the workflow uh, and look at it, the Gemba walk, the quality movement calls it, and get in there and look and see what are people doing. And what's the context? Is it are they inside? Are they outside? Is it snowing and raining? Is it freezing? Is it hot or what? What is that context? In the educational world, you don't need to worry about. You can't worry about all of that normally. Now, vocational schools, yeah, you can get much closer to it when you're doing educational systems like that. Yeah. So let's zoom in on that enterprise context here, because that ability to be so specific is in some ways a blessing and a curse that we can get really concrete on what are the tasks that have to be performed. On the other hand, there's a lot of different tasks that need to be performed. And so for an L&D department to think about, well, how can we support all that can feel really overwhelming. Now, one of the things that you've talked about is the importance of L&D not trying to do everything, but instead being able to focus on the critical business issues. Can you talk a little bit about how you might encourage a department to kind of figure out where to attack in this whole range of you know, skills and tasks and performance challenges that could potentially be requests that are coming at them? Yeah, so one of the things about the critical business issues, which is a phrase that I learned in 1981 from the late Gary Rumbler, so one of my heroes, my mentor, my, my main mentor, but he talked about CBIs, critical business issues. These are known and understood and owned by the leadership of your enterprise. Now, learning and development needs to get aligned with the leadership so they're working on things that are critical and not low-hanging fruit. So there's a continuum, of course, of, of issues, uh, problems and opportunities that our organizations face. And the, the thing to go after is those things that have high stakes, which means high risks and or high rewards versus medium stakes versus low stakes. So most of the time, learning and development folks, our own learning and development leadership, they're not in a position to assess and decide, well, that's low stakes, that's medium stakes, that's high stakes. This is for the business to decide because something that might look like low stakes right now for, from our perspective might be the leadership is going, yes, but in three quarters from now, that's going to become a big deal and we need to get ready for that now. It's not important today. It's going to be important in the near-term future. So aligning with our leadership to make sure we understand, you know, what keeps them up at night? What are they worried about? You know, what are the current state, current day problems and opportunities? And what are the near term future opportunities and problems that they foresee? And what are the medium term? And of course, we can get out as far as the strategic plan goes for the organization and try to understand what are the implications for the strategic plans, the tactical plans, the budgets that different functions have to meet today's needs and tomorrow and the future's needs? We need to be aligned with all of our internal customers and make sure that we're supporting them in achieving their goals. We Learning and development is a service organization. We should not be making decisions on what is it we're going to produce because when that happens, what I've seen, what I've witnessed in my clients is that they go for the one size fits all. Hey, who doesn't need active listening? So let's do active listening and we'll give that to everybody. Now, 
We don't know what they're doing with it. We don't know what their performance context is. We don't know which tasks where they're employing active listening to produce specific outputs. So we can't measure our impact because we are clueless. We are addressing topics or behaviors. And the late Tom Gilbert in his 1978 book, Human Confidence, taught, bemoaned the cult of behaviors. And that's when we see behaviors as the ends, when it's really a means to the ends of outputs, you know, producing outputs. And so sometimes we latch on to topics or knowledge. Skills is a big deal nowadays, skilling, reskilling, upskilling, or competencies. That was, you know, the thing that came around 30 years ago. Now skills are displacing that. But we're too focused on those means to the ends, and we don't understand the ends. And so we think the means are the really key thing. So if we just have a bunch of content on various skills or competencies, we've done our job. Well, that's one size fits all kind of thinking, which, you know, is faulty. And if we don't help people understand how to apply knowledge and skills and behaviors and competencies in their specific workflows, if we don't do that, it's less likely to actually transfer out to the job. And then it's not going to have any kind of a positive impact. It's going to have a negative impact and negative ROI. Um, so when we get requests for, you know, do something on this topic or this knowledge or this skill or this competency, we need to understand who the target audiences are. Now, my sneaky trick number 47 is to do my own active listening when I get a request so that the, the requester knows that I've heard them and I understand their request. And then I look for an opportunity to shift the conversation to, so what would practice with feedback look like? And would there be just one for everybody or would people have different applications of this in their work? And that is sometimes eye-opening for the requester, the potential client, and they could go, oh, yeah, that active list, yeah, people use that in all sorts of different things here. So well, then I can, that gives me an opportunity to talk about authentic practice with feedback is required for people to really hone that skill to um, master it so that they have both the competence and the confidence to go back to the job and apply it. And if we have them practice on what I like to joke about is somebody else's job, because that's not how I use active listening, but I'm doing the exercise, I'm practicing this, I'm getting feedback, but this isn't real for me. I won't have the competence and the confidence to go apply this. And, and if I go try to apply something in my workplace, in my work, and it doesn't work right away, I'm going to default immediately to what used to work best for me. I'm not going to struggle with it. I'm going, and then the whole effort is a total waste of time and effort and will not have any kind of a positive return on those investments that our organizations have made. Yeah. And so as we ask, you know, the business, so what would authentic practice with feedback look like on, say, active listening, we might discover that, hey, what we're looking for with someone who works in customer support is very different than what active listening looks like for a project manager. And maybe to take the next step here and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it sounds like there actually might be very different paths for how each of those scenarios would show an ROI on a business for the business. And if we try to say, hey, what's going to be the benefit of training people in active listening, right? We're getting a bunch of question marks, but if we divide that out, we can say, all right, well, here's how we show that the needle had moved with our customer support team. Here's how we'd be able to see the impact on the business from the project managers and so on. Is that right? That's, that's it. Uh, if we don't understand the specifics of the application of a knowledge, a skill, a behavior, or a competency, if we don't understand that, then we can't report back our impact because we don't know where those impact, where that could have had impact or not. And we are left with reporting out learning activities, the number of times that this course was taken, the number of people that actually completed it versus dropping out, the their, their smiles test results, whether they felt it was engaging or not or complete or not. But it's all about learning activities, which are a means to the ends of impact. And so 
uh, one of the things that I was taught back in that first year, back in 1979, uh, my uh, the Kirkpatrick model, the four levels of evaluation, even though he didn't want them to be called levels necessarily, but it's, you know, uh, what's the reaction level number one? Level two, did they master the objectives? And of course, we've already discussed objectives. Three, did it transfer? Four, did we get results? Now, the Phillips have created, you know, a fifth level ROI, but I was always told from way back in 79 that results were ROI because that's all our management and executives cared about. So we're not going to talk about results. We're going to convert that right into ROI for them. So there's a similarity in their models. But we would start, I was told, we're going to start with results. We're going to measure results. And if we don't get results, if we're not seeing the results out in the workplace with our target audiences, we're going to look to see if transfer happened or not. And then if transfer happened, but we're not getting the results, well, then we're going to look at what the objectives were that were mastered. Were they mastered or not? Because if people didn't master them, then of course it's not going to transfer and have impact. But let's say that transfer did happen and we're not getting the results. So we can go back and look at, well, what were the objectives? What was taught? What was learned? And, and what I was told is that we're never going to look at those smiles tests because they're meaningless. Um, and I think a lot of people in research has uh, borne that out. That uh, there's a famous story about uh, the late Roger Chevalier, who worked at, for one of the big real estate agencies, and he had 100. He inherited 100 instructors, and he was told he was going to have to get rid of 10 percent of them. So he had to get rid of uh, 10 of his instructors, and they gave him all the data about the feedback from the students. And he looked at that, and he picked out, okay, these are the 10 who have the worst feedback from students. But now let me look at the students that have gone out into the world to do the job to sell real estate and who did best. How do the instructors compare and contrast given that as the metric? And he found out that the ten, that the instructors that got the 10 worst scores from their students had the best students and were outselling everybody. No, the students didn't like those instructors because they were tough. They made them do extra work, you know, they, the, the instructors actually made these people work to learn and they actually learned. And when they got out to the job, they excelled. So we don't want to look at smiles tests because generally they could be quite misleading. We really need to look at did impact happen? Did the, th did the content transfer? Did the knowledge and skills taught the capabilities? Did they transfer out to the job? Yes or no. And if they didn't, what were the barriers? Did the supervisor say, guy, you're doing it in a newfangled way and I don't know how to do it. Do it the old way because I know how to manage that. I know how to monitor that. So don't do that. So that just meant we didn't anticipate those kinds of barriers and do something about it. We didn't have something for, you know, I would tell my clients, transfer is up to you, not me. I can generate great content, but the supervisor could stop it cold. So if you want this to actually be used out in the field, in those target audiences, you, my client, my stakeholders, you need to go to your management chains and put in an inspection process. You need to monitor whether or not the supervisors are embracing this. And maybe we need to do something for the supervisors so that they know this is coming and this is what changes they need to make in their performance because maybe they need to plan work differently, they need to assign work differently, they need to monitor work differently, and they need to troubleshoot work differently. Because if they're, we're teaching people new things, then there's a lot of people affected by that, just not the performer, but more, normally their management chain is also affected. Yeah. So it sounds like some of the symptoms here that an L&D department may have lost sight of some of these critical business issues is if they're reporting out on metrics that are just inside of their department, if they're focused on activity completion rates, if they don't know what should be changing in the business or who the specific audience is, what the specific use case is. Um, and if they're just looking at generic topics, right, those are probably indications that we've lost the thread a little bit. Um, this is you know, a really different way of thinking about development than a lot of people are familiar with. And so let's talk a little bit about what this looks like to put into place in an L&D department. What sort of skills or processes or infrastructure do L&D leaders need to develop within their organizations and their teams in order to be able to create this focus on these critical business issues? That's a good question. So I have... Uh 
fairly recently, maybe in the last several years, started talking about the philosophies, the processes, and the practices. And I think this is what leadership, L&D leadership needs to embrace. And then they need to sell it. They should not send L&D practitioners out into the world and have them explain what we're doing differently. This needs to be bought in top down. Our leadership in L&D needs to go to the enterprise leadership and tell them what we're going to be doing differently and why that's going to be a good thing. They need to sell that. And they need to get that to be accepted because if clients don't allow you to do analysis, because that's just analysis paralysis, and we never saw a darn good thing come out of it, so not you're not going to do that on my project, well, that's a huge barrier, and we shouldn't ask L&D practitioners to go out there and push this into the organization. This needs to be pulled. It needs to be sold. It needs to be expected, and we need to see good results from that. So the whole philosophies of why you want to take a performance-based approach, a performance-oriented approach, um, it has got to be sold. And part of that, I think, is that, you know, sometimes we, well, oftentimes, we rely too much on people's memories. So we are in the habit of, of trying to teach everything to people and have them memorize it when they're not going to be able to. So we can produce performance guides checklists, flow charts, whatever, that allow people to perform in the workflow when the performance context allows for a referenced performance response. In my experience, it it does exist, but it's rare, it's it's the minority of tasks and outputs where I've got to know something on demand and and have a memorized performance response where there's no time to look anything up. Now, if I was an emergency medical technician, yeah, there are things that I've got to know when I hit the scene and I can't look up something in some standard operating procedure book. Um, but there are things, you know, so I've written in the back of an ambulance before and uh, there were things that happened, you know, when they put me on the gurney and put me in the ambulance and they took me off. And then I I realized that somebody was in, in the back with me was looking things up. They were in a book looking things up. And so they were referencing things that weren't needed immediately on the scene, but on the ride to the hospital, they could look things up. So we need to understand when we're looking at performance and we need to just, again, explain this and sell this to people that we're going to be producing performance guides or job aids or performance support or workflow learning. It's called many different things. And we're going to, when we do a learning experience, we're going to get people to memorize things because the job demands that they have that memorized. If the job doesn't demand that, well, then why are we doing it? Why? So, but a, a quick story here. Back in 1979, when I got out of college, went to my first job, I was told, yeah, we're going to do job aids and we're not going to do training. Well, our clients hated that. Now, the two people that I was working with, they were brand new to the company like I was at the headquarters uh, training services organization. And so we simply did another sneaky trick, and that is we embedded job aids into the training. So our clients got the training that they were expecting and demanding, and the learners, who are performers, got guidance on how to do the job so they didn't have to rely on their memories for everything. And if you use a job aid often enough, you're going to get it. It's going to become memorized. But for doing the annual inventory, you're not going to memorize that one year to the next. So we can give guidance. It's like a standard operating procedure. Maybe it's not highly regulated. Maybe there's no regulations, but we can provide that kind of guidance to people on how to do the job step by step because it needs to be done correctly. But we can't pretend that we're going to have it memorized. Now, there are cases where we can't predict the demand and the demand can come out of the blue. And so we would address that with a learning experience where we get you to memorize that. But then because of the forgetting curve, we're going to worry that guy is going to forget that by the time he needs it. So we're going to have to do spaced learning and send and have guy uh, deal with that content so that we can keep that fresh in his mind and keep it ever present so that it's at the ready when demanded. And that's expensive to do. And that's that's that conflicts with guy doing his job. He got to interrupt his job so he can, we can remind him of this. So he'll keep it at the ready. So we want to minimize that. And we want to use more 
performance guides kinds of things. That's my language for it. Um, and, and so this is really critical. So, so this is philosophical. Now, how do we put in the processes to make that happen? So my process is I do, you know, I have an intake process that leads to project planning. Then I have a gate review meeting with the client and stakeholders so they can approve this and know what we're going to do and get us the people and resources that we need. Otherwise, we're begging for them and we don't often get the right people. Um, and then we do analysis and design and development and pilot testing. And then there's a final revision and release. So I've got methodology and I've put this in books and on my website, et cetera. Step by step, what do you got to do? To, to make this kind of happen. So we can put in the kinds of processes that we need. Now, the real world often doesn't appreciate or accept rote performance. So while I might say, here's the steps to do this thing, if the situation is different on a project, we may have to vary our approach. And these are the different practices that we use within our processes that are consistent with our philosophies. If our philosophy says it's about all about performance, no kidding, learning, yeah, maybe if we need that, otherwise we're gonna give people a job aid and they're gonna go do the work and they won't have learned anything. And that's fine with us, despite the fact that on our door, it says learning and development. And so we have this philosophy of performance first or performance orientation or focus on performance, many different ways to articulate this. And that's gotta be our mantra. Well, that's what everybody needs to know, that that's what we're all about. And if it requires learning, fine. If it doesn't, then we're going to give you guidance. And, and so I think that that's what leadership needs to embrace and understand. They need to sell it. They need to implement that. And then they need to develop their people to do it. Because just because we put in philosophies and processes and practices doesn't mean our people can automatically begin to do it. So we have to when we sell this, explain to our clients and, and stakeholders that we're going to need a little time to begin to master this. So things might take a little bit longer to start with before we start speeding up because we've we've got what, what Carl Binder calls fluency, the ability to do these things quickly. And, and so I think that's what leadership has got to do. And why haven't they done it? It's a lot of work. It's a huge challenge they themselves may not understand what this is really going to take. And they need to may bring in help, which means they might have to ask for budget resources to bring in external consultants or whatever to help them master this. And there are lots of people out there in the world selling. They can help you do this, and they may or may not be able to. So there's a wariness, um, perhaps, of leadership they're not sure who they can trust to really do this. They can't bring in people who will spend a lot of money and time and not end up with the results, not end up with good processes and practices in place and people uh, competent to perform within those processes. So it is tricky and it's probably a little bit scary for them. And, and uh, too many of them are just continuing to do what has always been done. They embrace more of an educational model. We give you people content. It's all got face validity. It doesn't have performance validity because it doesn't go that last mile to teach people how to apply this in their jobs. And we report out uh, activity, uh, learning activities as if they were meaningful because we don't have the business impact um, measurement data that would truly be much more meaningful. You know, one of the things that I suspect uh, learning leaders will encounter as they're going through this process is that they're going to run into enterprise leaders who also don't know really what to ask for. And so you'll have an enterprise leader who says, hey, we've got this problem. We need some training on X. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some specific examples here so we can make it a little bit more concrete about how a learning leader can guide that enterprise leader to maybe frame the issue in a more performance focused way and, and figure out maybe how to start that conversation of shifting their expectations. I, I, I think I, well, this is a, this is a huge issue, I think. And uh, too often we want to tell everybody how we make the sausage. 
<laughs> and how wonderful it is and how, you know, and, and most people don't have any tolerance for listening to all of that. They just want us to get on with it. Mm -hmm. So I think rather than, uh, I think the best way to sell this is to actually start doing it mm -hmm. and explaining what you're doing and saying, hey, we want to start doing everything this way. Because if we can demonstrate through a project the, a performance orientation and how this is different and have people talk about how that's different and have that client go around to the rest of the organization talking about, hey, this is much better. Uh, and, th you know, this is why I would embrace this. And I want them to do it this way all the time. I want them to move away from that educational model, which is what has trapped everybody, because we've all experienced the educational system. We all are pretty sure that we understand what that is. Somebody comes in and tells us a bunch of stuff, and then we go off and we try to figure out how to apply it. So that's what we're doing. And, and getting down to the brass tacks of performance tasks and outputs and the measures for both is very different. But you need to, the leaders need to be looking for an opportunity. They need to have build an alliance with a client and just do one and then tout how this is different why we would want to do this differently for everything in the future, why we want to move away from that educational learning model, if you will. And I, I don't mean to bash educational learning in this, but in an enterprise, we need to teach people how to do their jobs exactly. You know, if somebody is operating the console for at a nuclear power station, we don't want to give them just a bunch of topics and a bunch of knowledge and a bunch of separate skills. We want an integrated thing that teaches them how to perform and how to react to whatever it is that they are going to confront in their real work. And, and so, but not everything is that critical, right? And so one of the things that, that needs to happen is that we need to quit working on low hanging fruit, applicable to everybody. Well, we could have left that to informal learning trial and error learning, social learning, and that might have been sufficient. It wouldn't have been uh, efficient, but it might have eventually been effective. We really need to focus our energies and our resources on the high stakes performance. And because it's high stakes, we're more likely to get acceptance for a performance orientation because we really want people to perform. We can't have them take nine months to figure it out. We need them to figure it out in nine days. And so when we constrict, collapse the learning cycle by being more performance focused, we can have better, faster, and cheaper performance because we got it done much more quickly, much more effectively. I would always go for effectiveness over efficiency and once I got it effective, I would work on efficiency unless that efficiency would start to impact negatively the effectiveness of my instruction. Yeah. So so let's talk about what that conversation then looks like. We've reached out to a senior leader because we really want to understand what's on their mind. We're trying to focus on the critical business issues. And when we say, hey, what keeps you up at night? The answer that comes back is leadership development. They start saying, hey, we need some better frontline leaders. And they've got this real sense that leadership is the bottleneck for the organization. But at this point, they may not be articulating that in terms of specific tasks or outputs. They may not be able to talk about it much in terms of even business impact yet. If you're lucky, you might have someone who connects the dots and says, well, you know, we're having leaders, you know, have lots of turnover because they're not keeping their people engaged, but it, that might be as far as it goes. Walk us through the next couple of steps of that conversation to start putting that in the, the right direction. Well, so uh, back in 93, my two business partners and I sat in our conference room for three days and took 20 different analysis reports that we had done for instructional purposes on management populations. And we generated a uh, what we call a, a, a generic model of management that we would use as a template to start the next projects. And I've used this probably a dozen times since 93. Um, but it really segments management into what I call areas of performance. Other people could call them major duties or key results areas or accomplishments. But it's a way to frame the task performance and production of outputs. 
So there's strategic planning and there's operations planning and there's communications. Well, you can begin to imagine, you know, what's produced as the output while well, we get a strategic plan. There's a whole bunch of steps to generating a strategic plan. And there's a whole bunch of steps to producing an operations plan and budget. And there's a whole bunch of steps to producing a communications plan and then producing communications per that plan. But we can we can organize the world of work into segments like marketing uh, segments, uh, a target audience or a population or something. And there, uh, the difference, uh, the best segmentation scheme gives you the best insight for your needs, not for necessarily everybody else. So I've got this management areas of performance model and it segments that. So, but it's that, that allows me to focus on, so what's the output? We got this bucket called strategic planning. So, you know, is the output a strategic plan? I ask stupidly and people go, well, yeah. And so we can begin to describe. So what's the process to produce that? How if that's the end product, what what's the product before that? Well, we generate this kind of data and that kind of data and this kind of data. Then we massage and invent, look at it and blah blah blah. And then we create a draft of a strategic plan, and then that goes through a review process with the executive committee or whatever. And then we have a final strategic plan, and that sets the direction at this point in time for moving forward. And of course. The world can change, things can change, and we'll have to revisit that and change our strategic planning. Maybe we used to do strategic plans for five years. Then recently we were doing them for three years. Now we're doing them for the next year, you know, because things, these cycles have changed. But so the whole goal, whatever the request is about, is to get it down to performance. And this is tricky, whereas the person who's taking the request or dealing with the executives to talk about the outputs that are produced. You know, people are on the payroll to produce outputs. They're not there to know stuff. They got to know stuff to produce outputs. And my output might be your input. So I may produce an interview guide so that I can generate interview data so that I can give you the interview data and you can produce a script. And then when you get the script approved, finally, you do a storyboard and that goes over to the people going to shoot the video and edit the video and produce a video. And so there's this chain of performance. And so we've always got to be thinking about how do we get down to that, those brass tacks of the outputs and their measures and the tasks and their measures and the enabling knowledge and skills that are required in order to perform the tasks. And, and so but again, if you're talking to somebody and you're trying to explain this, the tricky question is, I think, is to always ask, so what would practice with feedback look like? So we got people working individually or in small groups or in teams to, you know, to reflect the real world, how this is done. And what are they doing and what are they producing? So that, you know, when we looked at their final product, we can assess whether this is any good or not. So how would we measure that using the measures from the real world? And how would we look at the behaviors and the tasks and the dialogues that happen in the production of that output? How would we assess whether that was good, bad, or indifferent? And so it's it's changing, it's shifting, it's segueing from, you know, a topic or whatever the request is to how is that operationalized? What does that look like in the real world? We want to, you know, the best learning, the best training, the best instruction is doing real work, but something that's problematic. So we simulate real work. We might use last week or last month's real work, and guy's going to work on that now, and we'll see if he can come up with the right answer or produce the right output based on something that's real. Um, and so we're, we're usually in abstraction. We're usually one or two levels off from real work. Um, and all we're trying to do is use real work as the basis, as the anchor for how we're going to provide instruction, how people are going to learn how to do their job. It's by doing things that are darn close to real work. Like the uh, fighter jet uh, pilot, uh, we're going to put him in a simulator and it's going to have, you know, 50 lights and flashes and bells and whistles and all that stuff. And then we're going to, once they've mastered that, we're going to move them into the next simulator, which has got 250 flashing lights and bells and whistles and all that stuff. And then we're going to move them into the one that's got 500, which is actually the real cockpit. And so now that we've eased them into that real work situation, 
Sure. But it's always got to be about, you know, what's the terminal performance? And so what are the terminal performance objectives? And what do you what are the learning objectives that associate with that? So depending on who your client is and how willing they are to think about these kinds of things, um, I when I'm talking to my clients, my prospects, and I understand what function they come from, sales or marketing, HR operations or whatever, and I, I've got a lot of experience working across all sorts of different functions across you know the modern enterprise. So I can begin to ask some questions that begin to relate to the work that they do, because in their work, they do production, but they had to put something in place in order to do production, whatever they're doing, finance and budgeting. So what is the analysis equivalent for them? How do they design their own processes and things? How, what are good outputs for them and not? And so if I begin to talk in their language and and ask them questions about how they do it, they can see the logic in what I'm trying to do because I'm trying to get people to be able to do their kind of work. And so we need to understand that. We need to document it. We need to put people through practice with exercises on the things that are tricky. And there's some things we can just tell people and that should be fine and sufficient. But there's other things where it's trickier and or, and or it's more critical. So we want them to practice more and more on those kinds of things. Yeah. Does that help? It, it does. And I want to connect back to something that you had mentioned at the very start of our conversation about the unconscious nature of knowledge. And you take a master performer, they don't know a lot of what they're doing just because they've internalized it so much. Um, you know, in the last couple of minutes, we've talked a lot about processes and documenting the tasks. And it can be really easy for someone to walk away from that thinking, oh, so we're just talking about stuff that's rote. And, and that's not what I'm hearing you say at all, that we can have things you know, like create a strategic plan, right, where it's really a sophisticated thinking and reasoning where, you know, the there's certainly steps that someone goes through. We need to get, you know, an understanding of what those steps are or what the thought process is, but that doesn't mean it's rote or unsophisticated. Yeah, um, that's, I mean, the, the, so you've got to start someplace. So when people say, well, there's many ways to do this guy, and I would say, okay, let's pick one. Let's let's create a, a one version that works under certain situations, not everything. Let's define what that process is. Let's talk about the situational varies that make this the appropriate response. Now let's talk about variations, appropriate variations, depending on the situation. So one of the things that, that what I've learned, and I wrote a book about this, the three Ds of thought flow analysis uh, back in 2021. And I, when I was dealing with uh, Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, about his cognitive task uh, analysis methods. And I, he told me about this back in 2004 to start with. And, and I began to realize that, okay, so one of the things that I realized in my instructional development experiences is that my content kept on getting more and more complete. People kept on finding holes and plugging them. And, oh, okay, so I need to be open to the fact that, you know, <laughs> that's likely to happen on the next project too. And, and so this, so the whole nature of, of looking at the performance and beginning to understand if this is rote, there's only one way to do it. Well, that's fine. But most of the world isn't like that. There's situational values. The client wants you to do it a little bit differently this time. Or the regulations have just changed. And they've said, if this is the situation and you do it this way, if that's the situation, you do it this other way. Um, and so it's beginning to create an anchor, and then from there, talking about the appropriate variations and what would trigger the variation A, B, or C. What are the things in the performance context that would cause you to go a different route? And what I've learned from dealing with master performers, that's my language for them, um, what Gilbert called exemplars, um, what, was that they had their favorite approach, and that's what they would tell me. And then when somebody else would say, well, I do it this other way, and they would go, well, yeah, I would do it that way if this was going on, but normally, you know, that's not. So I do it this way. And you'd find out that there are so there's some arbitrariness in how experts do things, what they do and how they do them, um, that may be for their context most appropriate most of the time. 
but that they vary those things when the situation comes up. But they're not thinking about that. They, I ask them a question, it's annoying to them. They go, okay, it's step, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And somebody else says, well, I wouldn't do that step three there. I would do this and do these other things. And they would go, well, yeah, I would, I've done that on occasion when it was necessary, but it's not always not. And you begin to find out that there's more than one way to do this. It, it becomes a question now of that poor learner who wants to become a performer what is it that we teach them? What do we want them to learn first and second and third? And what's the timing for that? Is that all in one learning experience? Or we say there's an, a beginning and an intermediate and advanced. And is that how this frames? And so when will we give them the intermediate stuff after they've mastered the beginning stuff? So these are these lead to conversations with master performers. And I love having them in the room with me so they can argue it out. Mm -hmm. And I've had to get into, I've had to teach them, all right, there's this thing called heated agreements where you guys would argue about something for about 5, 10, 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden, you, somebody would say, do you mean such and such? And they go, well, of course. And they turn to me and they go, never mind, we're fine. Because they, they're, the language that we use to describe things is faulty. And we call thing the same thing different labels. And we use the same word to mean different things across you know a group of people and so that's one of the things that i have to sort through is what is the appropriate thing to call our performance our tasks our outputs our 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 contextual um variances you know the regulator the customer so so that's one of the things that is tricky about doing this is trying to get everybody to some sort of a common agreement about okay i don't call it that but i understand what you mean so we can call it that um, West Coast calls it this, East Coast calls it that. The people in the South have a different label altogether. So it's negotiating all of that and knowing as an analyst, that's what you're going to confront. Now, if you're working at the same facility, generally they call it the same thing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they can't communicate. But if there's three facilities across the uh, planet and and they're and they're all doing the same thing, they're going to have different language for what they do. And so that's what's also tricky is that when we do our analysis, we have to look at, so where's the target audience? Are they all in the same building? Are they in, you know, different buildings? Are they working with in groups? Are they themselves working from home? You know, what's the situation here? So we can begin to test for the kind of variances that they that are part of their real world. Because if we call something the and the rest of the world calls it the, that's going to make it more difficult for the learner to figure out the and the are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and those are the kinds of things, those are the kind of conversations I have with the experts because a lot of times they know that, oh yeah, people on the West coast, they call it this, we call it that, you know, and, and I, when I'm talking to them, I understand what they're saying because I can translate that, mm -hmm. but guy, the analyst may not understand that right away. And so I try to leverage the expertise of, master performers and other subject matter experts to try to pin this down. And, and the question always becomes, I can, we, I, they can help me identify these variances, but then it becomes a question of, so what do we share with the learner? What do we confront the learner with? What set of language, what set of processes to start with and all of that. And, and these are negotiations that I have to have with, the, because sometimes uh, I've had uh, master performers show up to meetings and they were told, we're, we're going to teach sales skills first and product knowledge second. My management told me, don't let them do it reversed. And the rest of the room is going, no, we want to we want to teach the product features and benefits first and then teach you how to sell them. So, you know, people come in with their biases either their own or imposed on them by their management and their culture. And we have to negotiate all of that. So it can become a little bit messy, but we've got to be prepared to sort through all of that with the group and come up with some logical, rational decisions about what we're going to do when we begin to uh, sort and configure the content for the an instructional flow. And so 
let, let's start pulling this all together then. I'm going to give you a case from Hades here and see what we can do with this. So, um, you know, let's say what's keeping our executive up at night is future readiness. They've been reading a bunch of reports from big consulting firms and are now starting to pick up all that techno babble. You know, we need to upskill the workforce so we're ready for the future of work and AI is coming. And so we just, you know, you've got all of this kind of buzzwords flying at you. Um, let, let's kind of play out what that might sound like. So we would start by asking, hey, so what would authentic practice with feedback look like in you know this topic area? And you know, there's probably some vacant scares for a little while. We might start getting them to think, well, well, we probably need to, and they might say things like, we need to have a better understanding of what skills we're going to need in the workforce in the future, or we need to understand what are the risks that AI might pose to this area of the business or whatever. And then based on that, we'd start saying, okay, well, you know, who are some of the people that we, you know, think are exemplars in the organization right now? We might find out there's, you know, someone in maybe our purchasing department that really seems to have an eye on things that are coming get this list of master performers together, we start talking with them and try to elicit, you know, almost a process or a set of tasks for what they do and what, what outputs they're creating in order to, you know, know what's coming or, you know, to understand these trends. And maybe we start to get now, okay, well, we need to have understanding of, you know, some of the, the big trends and what those trends enable or some of the pressures that are on the business, things like that. And so we start to get the sense of like, here's the analysis that these master performers are doing in order to figure out what skills their team needs. And then based on that, they're creating a gap of like analysis of here's what we're good at right now. Here's where we need things. And so they're able to be future ready. But what that really means is that they understand what skills might be needed in their team in the future. They understand where the gap gaps are. They've you know collected resources to help people fill those gaps or explore things like and you know, and so that sort of process might now lead us to a much more concrete and performance-driven understanding of you know this what started off as just corporate buzzwords around the future of work and AI. Is that kind of what that process might look like? Well, yeah. So I I got to tell you a story here from 1981, <laughs> and I was at Motorola, Motorola's training and education center. And I already didn't like the name of my organization. What's education doing in there? We're all about training, not education, because we should. And my client, uh, I, I serve manufacturing materials and purchasing organizations. And my clients wanted me to create some instruction for their manufacturing management from supervisors on up about uh, computers on the factory floor. Computers weren't on the factory floor in 1981, but they were coming. And I said, well, you know, I kind of what you were just saying here, I tried to get it down to the brass tacks. So what are they going to be applying this for? And they said, we don't know. We need you to educate our management groups so that they can figure, begin to figure out how they're going to use a computer, what they're going to use a computer for, because we don't know. And it was an epiphany for me because I had been kind of a purist about it's got to be training and not education, you know, because I had drank that Kool-Aid. Sorry for the expression. Um, but but that's, you know, that's where I was coming from. And I, I, I began to realize that, oh, there is a place in a corporation for education where we're going to teach topics that are future oriented and the future ain't here yet. So we don't know what the application is, but it's something that's coming. So we need to educate our people so they can begin to figure out how, how they see using this. Computers are coming. What are you going to do with a computer? Well, what's a computer do? So they need to have that basic understanding. Um, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, chatbots. How are we going to use? Well, if people don't even know what the hell those are. We're going to have to educate them as to what is the current state status of these kinds of things? What are other applications that other people are using so that we can begin to feed them and their imaginations in terms of what the heck they might start doing with these things in the future? So whereas I would strive initially to try to pin it down in terms of, well, who's going to use this? Uh, purchasing going to use this? Materials going to use this? They don't know. And they could be 
likely targets for that, but they don't know. And if I push them to give me an answer when they don't have the answer yet, that's dysfunctional. And so I need to be open to the fact that there's going to be a place for, and I think it's kind of minimum, but, you know, so when we're talking about, you know, skilling and reskilling and upskilling and getting ready for the future of work, well, what are some of the earmarks of that future of work? You know, if we're doing manufacturing kinds of things, people aren't going to be able to work from home. Well, really, guy, what if I have a robot there and I can control the robot from home and that's going to do my job? For, well, okay, so maybe that's different. So hmm. let's begin to imagine what the future of work means to our core business processes that produce the products and services that we render to the marketplace. Let's start there. And then there's all these support organizations like learning, like HR, like finance that aren't part of that core value stream of our enterprise, but are necessary to make it all happen. And what are those applications? So, <clears throat> so I think that we can violate, you know, my, my rule that about being performance based, but it's performance oriented. We just don't know sp the specifics of that performance orientation. So there is a place for us to do education to communicate, to make people generally aware, to educate, to make people knowledgeable, and to generate training to develop skills and performance competencies. So there's a wide range of the things that we can do. And sometimes we just need to begin communicating to people about here's some of the new things that are coming down. You know, we don't need to have everything be a two-hour module, but we can begin to talk about some of these things and what other companies are doing. So but it's best if I have asked the purchasing people, what's going on in the purchasing world? Are you in tune with the purchasing councils and the and the uh, professional affinity groups of purchasing people? What are they talking about? And so let's bring that in and, and share that with the rest of the purchasing people. You know, the materials organization may not need to know any of that. So again, we need to kind of focus by the segments of the functionality, the processes, and what people do for a living and bring to them. And so we can't be responsible for everybody's learning. Uh, we can help our organizations understand that people need to belong to their professional affinity groups. They need to have access to the internet while at the job. Yeah, and some of them may spend time on Facebook and you can monitor that and then you know, give the appropriate consequences for that. But they may need to tap into and do searches related to their world of work. And maybe rather than ask everybody to do that, maybe we need to ask a couple of people that seem to be desirous of doing that, willing to do that, and task them with bringing in information and sharing that with their groups in their community of practice. And some people would object to, you know, top-down design of communities of practice, but I'm sorry, but if people in the purchasing organization, if we have one person bird-dogging the rest of the world for information about newfangled stuff for purchasing and what's coming and what other people are doing, maybe that's a good thing. We share that with purchasing, but the people in learning and development don't need to know any of that. And, and so we, we've got these functional entities where they have a certain set of expertise and they have a certain knowledge base we can begin to feed that. Um, and maybe the people in those functional areas can decide, does everybody last person in the in the purchasing area need to know this? Or is it just some of them? Is it management? Is it the individual contributors? Who should we channel this information to, this content to, to so that they stay up to speed on what's going on in the rest of the world? So they can begin to imagine what it is we might want to embrace and bring in here, what we may want to bring in to run a test. Hey, there's a newfangled tool out there and some new thinking about that. Let's bring that in and do a small test to see what, what, is that, what does that mean? What does that look like? What does that feel? What are the implications of doing that? What are the costs and what are the potential returns? And if things look like it's going to have this minimal cost with these huge returns, maybe we should test that. If something looks very expensive and we're not too sure what the returns might be, maybe we want to stay away from that, but listen to what's going on in the marketplace and figure out, are other people taking advantage of that? Maybe there's something that they see and are doing that we didn't see initially, and maybe now we need to revisit that. So 
given all the changes going on in the world and the advance of technologies, you know, learning and development should not be the bottleneck where we're going to control all of that. We're there to support organizations who should be learning themselves. They should become, and I hate the phrase, the learning organization, having a learning culture. Uh, I began to write recently about, I think everybody needs to strive to have more of a Baldridge culture, the based on the Baldridge Award and the criteria, because learning and a learning culture is a support to all of that. There's more things than just being a learning culture for learning purposes. There's a means, learning is a means to the ends of performance of our organizations. And so there's a bigger picture, a broader systems view of organizations that I think people need to embrace. Learning is a part of that, but let's not pretend that it's the be all end all and we are the kings of that. And isn't that wonderful for us? Yeah. Well, Guy, we've had a really great conversation here. As we wrap things up, I want to just take a step back. So we got really into the weeds of what it might look like to attack some of these issues. And you know, we started this conversation at a much broader place, which is getting learning and development to focus on the critical business issues. Let's suppose that you know, you're someone who's a leader in L&D, or maybe you're someone who's a practitioner, you're in charge of specific programs for your organization, things like that. What are some things that that would be easy wins as you get started on this journey? What should someone do uh, in order to try to just prove to themselves that this isn't a, an intimidating and terrifying process? What are some of the resources that are out there that they should be tapping into in order to help them as they're getting started with shifting from just delivering topics all day long to now figuring out, okay, how can we drive performance on those critical issues of the business? Well, uh, so there's resources and people that they can begin to look at, and there's things that they can do for the quick win. So let me start with the quick win. Um, I would tackle a project, one of the next projects that came my way, and produce more performance guides than learning experiences, uh, unless it required both. But most of the time when we tackle something like this, we can give people the performance guidance that they need in order to be able to do the job and they don't need to memorize anything. And you can call that learning, but I, I wouldn't. Um, and so I would look for the opportunity to do a kind of a, some demos here and to show clients that. And I wouldn't necessarily, and, and maybe I do it in a sneaky way, or maybe I'm quite overt uh, and share with everybody what I'm going to do before I do it. So, you know, that's a cultural thing and people need to figure out, you know, what's the best approach for them. There's one size does not fit all in that regard either. But there are others who are promoting kind of a performance orientation. Uh, I've mentioned Carl Binder. Um, there's people that I follow on LinkedIn and, and on uh, Twitter that are embrace this kind of thing. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with David James in England, and we've done a series, a two years series of pivot to performance, where we're bringing in people that he knows and people that I know that have made the pivot to performance. And sometimes it was way back in the day, and sometimes it's more recent. And they have experience and they've shared their thoughts about, you know, when and how do you do this? And everybody's a little bit different. So this is a, a forum, a chance for people to hear from those who have made that pivot. And our advice is, you know, just begin to do it. Don't ask for permission. Just start doing it. And the results will be there and your clients will be appreciative. And some people might question it, but most people will embrace it because they'll see this is this is different. This is having an impact on performance. It's just not people knowing stuff. Um, uh, there's uh, Donald Clark, one of my favorite people. He's got a, a series on the great minds and learning and uh, the, the whole history of the philosophy and practices, et cetera, in the learning field going back 2000 years. He's doing a podcast series with John Helmer, uh, Great Minds and Learning. John Helmer's got another podcast, The Learning Hack. Um, David James, who I mentioned just a moment ago, he's got a podcast, Learning and Development podcast. So there's a lot of good sources for this. Um, my friend Bob Mosier and his uh, business partner, uh, Conrad Gottfriedson, uh, they've got the five moments of need. This is another approach to this. Again, we all of us have similar but different language and imagery to explain basically the whole thing. But the whole thing is perf this performance orientation. 
and uh, they've got a book out and they've just started a, a new website that people can join. Uh, I, I don't can't remember it off the top of my head. It's workforce performance and learning something. Um, but it's fairly new. It's been out for maybe several months, and uh, there's a number of people that are joining this, and there's places to have dialogue and and to learn from other people that are going through the experience, because we can learn from others who have blazed these trails and learn from their successes and their failures, um, and and pick up on and and adopt what we can and adapt the rest. I've been doing that my entire career. People need to do that. There's not one right way for you. There's one right way maybe to start, but then you'll start varying things because your context is going to throw you situational variances and you're going to have to adjust to that. So this isn't quite a rote process, but there's a fundamental base of thinking. And there are many people who promote this and talk about this. Uh, Steve Villachica uh, is out at Boise State University and uh, he's kind of sliding into retirement, but he's got a performance uh lab i think that's the name of it but but where students are are working with um different firms uh, uh um usually nonprofit organizations and helping them not by just providing them with learning content but by looking at their processes and what the env environment uh needs to have in order to make those processes work and what then training or learning or instruction is needed to help people do their jobs um, and so there's many places now where this is uh, happening. I think the University of Maryland and the Baltimore campus, um, it, they're doing things like this. So this is kind of growing. Now, there was always pockets of this back in the, in the 70s and 80s. You know, Indiana University was big about this. They've been doing this forever. Um, um, the University of Michigan used to have programs on all of this. I don't know where that stands now. But but there are sources for this. My professional society since 1979, now ISPI, the International Society for Performance and Improvement, um, they have been kind of at the forefront of all of this for the longest period of time. And most of my professional network comes from that group. But lately, I've been expanding out to the people in Europe and et cetera that, uh, that are, be, are doing this. Um, so there are lots of books and lots of resources. Will Tallheimer. I also am on the executive advisory uh, committee for the Learning Development Accelerator, LDA. You can search for them online. And they are focused on learning. Now, my ten, I've been in the learning business forever, but I'm cognizant of and and embrace a broader thing called performance and perform looking at performance systems and the learning that's required within them. Because one of my jobs is to help my clients avoid spending money investing in learning when it's not going to do anything for them. So if the request is based on uh, new hires, then I expect that kind of a request. If this, if the request is based on a performance problems, I suspect that request because I'm going to be pretty sure to start off with that learning is not going to be the solution or the single solution for resolving the problem or opportunity that the clients have. Um, and so, again, there's many people, many organizations, um, and it's just, you know, connecting with them um, and, and learning from all of them. Uh, I always recommend to people that, you know, ask me to be their mentor. You need a bunch of mentors. You don't need one single source. You need a multitude of sources that have kind of been there and done that and learn from all of them and uh, adopt what you can and adapt your own and create your own set of approaches and methodology and language for this, knowing full well that you're going to have to adapt to whatever situation you find yourself in and embrace the language of your customer and client. Excellent. Well, Guy, thank you so much for this conversation today. It's been a pleasure. And to anyone who's listening to this, I hope that this is giving you some ideas on how to start your journey towards uh, really tackling the critical issues for your business, for getting your L&D department focused on the things that truly matter and getting a sense of how to elevate your work so that you're having an impact on that bottom line instead of just focusing on your own activities. So thank you very much. Thank you.